Hey, it's Sarah Fen, and today we're making a simple, no-knead sourdough bread with tangzhong. Tender artisan loaf filled with flavor and perfect for sandwiches and the like. It has the beautiful rustic appearance of a sourdough artisan bread and the soft crumb of a tangzhong bread. So let's get into the recipe first before going into the science. We have our tangzhong here, made around seven to eight hours ago. It's made with 80 grams of bread flour and 160 grams of boiling water. If you've been following this channel, you probably know how I make my tangzhong already. Basically, I prepare boiling water, measure it out, drop in the flour, mixing it quickly and thoroughly until all the flour is fully hydrated. Then I cover it with a cloth and wait until it cools down to room temperature before putting a silicone cap on it and putting it in the fridge for about eight hours. Why do we do this? Well, basically, if you let the tangzhong age in the fridge, you let some little tiny enzymes in the flour chop up big sugars into smaller ones that the yeast can eat and we can taste. So a better rise and better flavor. Technically speaking, you give the endogenous alpha and beta amylases in the wheat a head start on their main functions. The alpha amylase breaking down starch chains randomly and the beta amylase chopping off maltose from the damaged and gelatinized starch. This will give our bread a sufficient amount of simple sugars or reducing sugars such as maltose that contribute to the bread's natural wheat flavor and sweetness. Actually, many references suggest leaving the tangzhong for 24 hours or even more, but I've been using tangzhong that was aged in the fridge overnight for quite a while and it has given me satisfactory results so far. Although you may want to try the 24 hours as suggested for more sweetness. After tangzhong, we're going to prepare our leaven. For the leaven, I like to schedule it like this. I prepare the leaven immediately after making the tangzhong and then let it slowly ferment in the fridge. But you can also make it a few hours before you're gonna make your final dough if you're in a rush. It shouldn't be a surprise that to make a leaven, we need to have a mature sourdough starter to start with. Research shows that the new sourdough starters usually reach maturity after five to seven days of refreshments. So you feed the starter with flour and discard some for about a week. Of course, there are a lot of ways to make a sourdough starter. It's all roughly the same as long as we make sure the starter matures. Most importantly, letting the starter mature and drop in pH gets rid of harmful bacteria and other dangerous microorganisms. And at maturity, the rises and falls of our sourdough starter should have a very predictable pattern, which means it's ready to be used as a leavening agent. In this recipe, we actually only need 20 grams of sourdough starter in total, and that's because we're gonna make it into 11 that we're gonna use in our final dough. So in a mixing bowl, we combine 20 grams of starter with 40 grams of water and 40 grams of bread flour. We then mix everything together until it's well combined, cover it, and then we'll leave it for five to six hours until it rises to at least double in height. A levan lets us scale up our sourdough starter and gives us the much needed large number of microorganisms and hence gassing power to leaven our dough. That's why we only need 20 grams of starter to begin with. And by adding 40 grams of flour along with 40 grams of liquid, we end up getting the equivalent of 100 grams of sourdough starter. It also gives us a chance to change the flavor profile of our sourdough starter and eventually our bread. As we scale up our sourdough starter with 11, we also change its flavor profile due to new nutrients from the fresh flour and water. Or if you'd like to be more audacious, you could also use fruit yeast water instead of regular water. That's why we make it into 11 first. And when the leaven is done more than double in volume, we can get started on our final dough. We have our mise en place ready with all our ingredients, including the levain and the tangzhong. You can see that this is a very simple recipe. We don't have any extra ingredients other than the ones we need. But have you heard of the saying that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication? Well, that's what we're aiming for. To start, we're mixing all of the overnight tangzhong and 110 grams of water together. Simply leaving this slurry mixture alone for about five minutes can save us the time and effort required to dissolve the tangzhong in the mixture. 
in no need high hydration dose with tangcheng, we want to dissolve the tangcheng so as not to have any lumps of gelatinized starch get in the way of gluten development. And so we don't have to chew through lumps of starch in the bread. It used to be quite a challenge to break down the lumps by hand, but now just by letting the tangcheng soak, we can easily break it down. So I'm just gonna mix everything together. So after breaking down the tang chong into the water a little bit, just mainly breaking up the larger clumps, we're just going to leave it for five minutes for the tang chong to dissolve. All right, it's been about five minutes. I'm gonna give this a cursory mix. So it's much smoother. We still have very few big clumps, just gonna destroy them, but it's already pretty well dissolved. Okay, so now I'm going to add in all of our leaven. Just scraping it right in. And then seven grams of salt. Right before I add the flour, I'm just going to mix this until all of the salt dissolves. The importance of salt cannot be underestimated in this recipe. Due to the double whammy of both sourdough and tangcheng, their effect on the dough is basically to reduce gluten strength, which is something we'll talk about in more depth later. That salt really helps to strengthen the gluten by helping it tight up. So do not skip it. Whatever you do, do not skip it. All right, so now I'm gonna add in 270 grams of bread flour, just dropping it straight in. I'm going to give it a little mix with the spatula. The fact of the matter is, even if it's a no need recipe, we still do have some initial gluten development when we're mixing it like this. It gives our gluten network a little bit of a head start. All right, that's as far as the spatula can go. I'm just going to scrape off any dough. And now I'm going to start mixing it by hand. Just folding in the flour. It should only take about two to three minutes. We just want to get all of the loose flour combined. And that's pretty much it. All right. Going to scrape down these sides just to clean up a little bit. Scrape off my hands as well. And we're good. Okay. So you can see that the dough is still pretty shaggy, it's still pretty rough. It has some gluten strength, but that's disordered. The gluten chains are in a very random configuration. We would need to knead this if this were a regular bread dough, but it's no knead, so we're ending it here. And now we just cover it and leave it to rest for 40 minutes before we do our first and only stretch and fold on it. All right, so it's been 40 minutes. We're gonna do our stretch and folds. I've got a bowl of water. I'm gonna dip my hands in, and I'm gonna pull up one side of the dough. You can see how it actually looks a lot smoother right now. It's also a bit stronger. It can stretch so far. I'm gonna do four stretch and folds, one for each side. Last one. And since this is also our last stretch and folds, I'm gonna flip it, just tidy it up a little bit. Like that. There we go. All right, so I'm also gonna do a quick window pane test. You can see that actually it already passes because you can see my fingers through the dough. Although the main measure of a successful window pane test is that you can see light through it. You can stretch the dough out thinly enough to see light through it. You can also see the gluten development from when it starts to rip. 
and it should have nice and clean lines like this here. So if it's really jagged and if it's really like rough around these uh, edges, then the gluten development probably isn't that great. But you see, this is very neat. It almost looks like a perfect shape. So that's how you can tell that the gluten network is pretty strong. And this is ripping because I've stretched it out a bit too much, many times. This side is better. One last tidy up, and I'm gonna cover it. And now we're gonna leave this until it roughly doubles in size, which should take about two more hours. All right. So this timing depends on your room temperature and your specific sourdough starter. Make sure you keep an eye on the dough. For better flavor, better taste and texture as well, it's probably better to put it in the fridge overnight, but I wanna eat the bread today, so I'm leaving it out at room temperature. All right, so just before the dough is done with its bulk fermentation, I'm going to prepare its proofing spot. So I've got this container here, and I've lined it with this cloth, and now I'm just sprinkling it with rice flour and also a little bit of semolina flour. Helps add flavor. I wanna make sure it's really well coated. It is a sticky dough, sourdough after all. And we're good. All right, I'm gonna set this aside, and now we're gonna to get to work on our dough. I'm gonna use this scraper. All right, open up the dough. You can see how big and jiggly it is. I'm gonna use some flour to dust the top. The key to handling an artisan bread dough is to treat it like your baby. We do not want to degas it. We don't want to, to you know, subdivide the bubbles that are in there. It's not a shokupang or an Asian milk bread. Okay, get some flour into the sides and now I'm gonna flip it out over onto the work surface. Very gentle, it's coming up. There's also a no need for a pre-shaping here because we're gonna be making the uh, whole dough into one big bowl. All right, so you can see that it's roughly circular like this, a bit more rectangular actually. Now to start shaping it, I'm going to pull this bottom side out, flip it up over onto the center, all right? And then we're gonna fold in the sides, there you go. Fold in the top. And then I'm gonna use a bit more flour to prevent sticking. Fold it into the center like that. Flip and turn it. Round it out with our palms further like this. Okay. The goal is to make sure the flour stays on the outside. As you saw just now, I didn't add any flour to the center of the dough. I'm just letting the flour stay on the outside. All right. And we're pretty much done. Now, just before it goes into its proofing spot, I like to give it a fine layer of rice flour and also semolina in this case. Helps to prevent sticking. We wouldn't want it sticking to the cloth and ruining all of our hard work. Okay, now I'm gonna scoop it up from the bottom and flip it over. There you go, so seam side up, smooth side at the bottom. If you see any seams here that haven't been sealed, then this is where you would pinch them to closed, but I don't see any, so I'm just gonna sprinkle it with a bit more rice flour and semolina flour. Now I'm just gonna cover that up and we're gonna leave it to proof until it almost doubles in size, which should be a pretty similar amount of time, about two to three hours, depending on your room temperature and your sourdough starter. Super quick, super simple. Shaping sourdough is something that requires a bit of experience, so don't be nervous if you can't get it done as fast as I did. You just wanna take it slow, make sure you're not tearing the dough or anything, and use as much flour as needed on the outside to prevent sticking on your hands. Still quite clean. All right, so I've got my parchment paper here, and I've also finished preheating the oven to 250 degrees Celsius. 
what we're gonna do is that we're gonna bake it inside a Dutch oven for our optimum results. And we're gonna bake it with the lid on, top and bottom heat for 25 minutes at 250 degrees Celsius. Then we're gonna take the lid off, turn down the heat to 210 degrees Celsius and let it bake until it's done. The exact timing depends on your type of oven. One thing you wanna make sure though, is that the dough is really fully cooked all the way to the center. It's a tang chong dough, so it retains more moisture. We need to give it a little more time than for usual artisan breads to help it dry out and really set. Okay, since the recipe is done, let's get into the science of this bread. One of the most interesting parts of this bread is that we use both sourdough and tangchong. Now, you may have read somewhere that it's pointless to add tangchong to a sourdough bread. There are even some who say that you just simply cannot make a great sourdough bread better. I think this kind of thinking mostly comes from a misunderstanding on using tangchong in bread. On many online sources, the tangchong method has been solely stressed on its capability Ability to make the bread stay fresh and last longer, hence delaying staling. So in lines with such a way of thinking, since one of the positive impacts of using sourdough is exactly that, delaying staling due to its acidity, then many conclude that there's no need for tangchong. Well, as I've demonstrated in the many videos I made before, there are many ways to use tangchong with each having their own unique benefits. And likewise, I believe there are many ways to use the tangchong method in coordination with sourdough that can can make the bread better. Personally, I think that flavor-wise, the natural sweetness of tangchong and the sourness of sourdough strikes a balance in the bread and creates an even better taste and texture. These benefits come with a few caveats though. Sourdough and tangchong can end up causing somewhat similar issues with our bread dough that we need to watch out for. The main problem is gluten strength. This is due to the acidic conditions of sourdough speeding up proteolytic activity. Basically, the proteolytic enzymes in the flour work better at acidic pH levels. They break down gluten proteins. In small amounts, this is good since they contribute to the flavor and help the bread expand. But large amounts of proteolytic activity will get rid of too much gluten, resulting in a mess of a dough. Tangchong also results in the weakening of the gluten network, but in a pretty different way. The heating process actually denatures the proteins, so all the flour for tangchong can be practically considered ineffective in adding gluten strength to the dough. The double combo of sourdough and tangchong on the dough can weaken it greatly if we're not careful. So fermentation times are something we do need to pay attention to. While we're on the topic, I'll also add that there's also one very important ingredient, as we mentioned, that contributes to gluten strength, which is salt. From this paper, we learned adding organic acid to the flour raised the water absorption by 1%, but at the same time, the dough development time or peak time was reduced by 50%. The paper concludes that adding organic acid substantially decreased mixing time and weakened the dough. This surely raises the alarm for anyone that wants to combine sourdough and tangchong. It causes, like we said, that double whammy attack on the gluten network. This is where the salt plays its part. Again, from the paper, when 1.5% of salt baker's percentage is added to the flour, there was a 1.4% decrease in water absorption and two minute increase in the dough development time. The paper concludes that salt increased the mixing time and strengthened the dough. Now, this seems to be quite promising information for the curious home baker like us who love to experiment naturally. So we want to know what happens if sourdough and salt are combined. And yeah, from the paper again, and for the beauty of it, I'm gonna read some paragraphs here. The effects produced by incorporating both organic acids and salt into the flour varied with the factor measured or the levels of salt that were added or both. For example, compared with the control, the water absorption of the flour decreased substantially when organic acids plus salt were added to the flour. This was true regardless of the level of salt. When 1.5% salt was added, however, water absorption was lower than when 1% salt was added. These findings were unexpected because when these substances were used alone, the organic acids increased absorption and the salt decreased absorption. The combination of organic acids plus salt also increased dough development time and dough stability. 
The absolute effects, however, varied with the level of salt combined with the organic acids. For example, adding 1.5% salt produced a greater increase in the two factors than did adding 1% salt. In the presence of organic acids, 1.5% salt increased the mixing time by 8.3 minutes compared with only 0.8 minutes when 1% salt was added. Therefore, reducing the salt content by 0.5% is apparently quite critical in determining the mixing time when organic acids are present in the dough. The paper also goes on to state what chemical reactions occur when acids and salt are combined in a dough system are not known exactly. But it does provide a very beautiful graphic to illustrate what might happen, something like this. So the paper concludes a combination of both acids and salt increased mixing time and greatly increased dough strength, probably because of changes in gluten protein conformation. One more thing to add here, the 1.5% of salt is based on a flour with 11% protein content. So by simple calculation, we can say 1.7% is for the bread flour we use in this recipe. Our bread flour has a 13% protein content. So in the end, we use about 1.75% of salt in this recipe. Aside from salt in this recipe, we take on an extra step to deal with another of Tang Chong's issues, which is that it takes a longer time to mix in. It's been noted in the paper that Tang Chong takes a little longer to mix into the dough due to its colloidal state. That makes sense and is usually not a problem if you're using it for a shokubang or some sort of kneaded bread dough. But like we've said, this is a no-knead bread recipe, and we aren't aiming for full gluten development at all during the initial stage, which is why we added the extra step of mixing the Tang Chong and water together and letting them sit for five minutes. This dissolves the Tang Chong and to see how it works, we'll take a closer look at the science behind starch gelatinization again. You see, wheat starch gelatinization is the process by which whole starch granules in the wheat flour are swollen and eventually ruptured by heating to a temperature around 65 degrees Celsius in the presence of excess water to form a gel structure. We know that by preparing yudane or tangzheng with one part flour and one part boiling water, we have met the precondition of excess water, actually going way beyond the minimal requirement, and also of the needed gelatinization temperature. Technically speaking, during the process of gelatinization, in the presence of excess water and sufficient heat, the intermolecular bonds of starch molecules break down, allowing the hydrogen bonding sites, the hydroxyl hydrogen and oxygen, to engage more water, hence dissolving starch granules in water. As the gelatinized starch cools down, it then goes through a process called retrogradation, where the ruptured starch molecules starts to rearrange itself again to a more crystalline structure. This process gets accelerated in the refrigerator at 4 degrees Celsius. It can quickly lead to cinerosis. That's when liquid is being expelled from the gel. To some extent, that's the tang we have after an overnight stay in the fridge. When we drop this tang chong into our final dough and use our stand mixer to mix the dough, we don't really have any issues other than the higher dough tenacity and the lower tolerance to overmixing, problems that we have learned to overcome easily. It's not the same when dealing with high hydration tang chong doughs using hand kneading or the no knead method. It refuses to dissolve into the viscous dough due to the nature of gelation. I have found that letting the tang chong soak in water for about five minutes makes it way easier to dissolve it into the final dough. This may have to do with the interaction of intermolecular hydrogen bonds between water and the tang chong. Now, with the tang chong aspect aside on the sourdough side, you may also wonder, what's the point of making 11? Why not just use the 20 grams of sourdough starter and add it straight away into our final dough? Well, if we were to do that, we're going to have to wait for a very, very long time for the dough to rise. It's like the saying, Rome wasn't built in a day. And I can add that if it were to be built by one Roman civitas, then it might not have been built at all. Our dough is, in a sense, pretty much the same. Take a dough made with instant yeast, for example. Don't look at how small these instant yeast granules are. They contain a lot of yeast, specially selected for their incredible leavening and reproduction ability. But sourdough is different. The microorganisms in the sourdough are wild and naturally constrained in population. That's why the issue of insufficient dough leavening power or dough gassing power due to the lack of microorganisms in the fermentation is our main problem if we were to add the starter directly into the dough. Facing such an issue, we may be tempted to look for a quick fix by adding more sourdough starter. Like, okay, let's fix it. So how much more sourdough starter do we actually need? 
Let's see, for the total amount of flour, 400 grams, that we're using in this recipe, assuming for a moment that we are making a 100% hydration dough, we're gonna use 400 grams of water and 100 grams of sourdough starter. As explained in my previous video on sourdough, this one to four, four ratio of the starter and other ingredients means that we dilute our sourdough starter from one part to nine parts. So there will be enough nutrients for three generations of doubling time. From that video, we also know that as the cell number increases in a logarithmic fashion, the released carbon dioxide consecutively drives up the volume of the dough significantly. And we can infer that these successive rises in volume correlates highly with the steps in our bread making, bulk fermentation as a first rise, final proofing, and then the oven spring as a third rise. By conducting a small subjective experiment, we can predict the timing of each rise, which in turn can be used to guide our baking schedule. So pouring 100 grams of sourdough starter straight away into the final dough does appear to be a reasonable and workable solution. But here's the issue. To make the same bread, instead of the 20 grams we mentioned before, we now need 100 grams of sourdough starter. That is five times more than what we intended to use in this recipe. Now, 100 grams may not sound like a lot, but to anyone that regularly maintains sourdough starters, that can amount to five-fold waste or discard. Every time you feed the sourdough, you'd have to feed it flour and water and discard a sizable portion. This would still be fine if you made sourdough bread on a very frequent basis, like daily, but otherwise it's quite a bit of trouble. Personally, as a home baker, I have two batches of sourdough starters, one I keep in the fridge as a sort of backup, about 100 grams, refreshed every once a week, and an active one refreshed a day before baking, made with the sourdough starter from the fridge. The latter batch, usually about 75 grams, is the one I use to make my sourdough bread. With this arrangement, you can see that at any time, I don't really have 100 grams of sourdough starter to make bread. That's a large part of why I prefer using 11. There's also the factor that I said earlier, which is that 11 is a chance for us to change the flavor profile of the starter. And that's it for today. Thanks for watching and bye!